morning. Welcome to Expat Insights. I am Debbie Clements. I'm sitting in for Raju, who had a previous coaching and training commitment. Our guest for today is Dr. George John. He's an orthopedic surgeon and sports medicine specialist. Dr. John has the distinction of having officiated as sports surgeon for 15 international sports tournaments in tennis, football, and rugby. He's also been associated with Hollywood film production units. Dr. John is a visiting doctor from Dubai who plans to invest in a hospital in the Philippines catering to sports-related injuries and overall wellness. Dr. John, welcome to Expat Insights. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you to GNN. And uh, I'm privileged and honored to be here today. Great. Thank you. So let's start first of understanding what exactly is an orthopedic surgeon. What do you do? I mean, us generally orthopedic surgeons deal with uh, musculoskeletal injuries, that something to do with the bones and something to do with the muscles and ligaments. And um, as the name goes by, surgeon, that means you meant things together. Mm -hmm. um, more of like a job of a carpenter. So <laughs> that is what we do in orthopedic surgery, yes. Okay. And you're also in sports medicine specialist. So how does that link up with orthopedics? Uh, sports medicine is uh, something uh, I would say is a more specialized or super specialized um, wing of orthopedics. So people say sports medicine can be part of the orthopedics or orthopedics can be part of sports medicine. Now generally when you say orthopedic surgery that you're talking about any kind of uh, injuries happening with your musculoskeletal. So when you say sports medicine that, that itself uh, signifies that you've got something to do with your sports. Something okay. to do with your sports injuries, sprains, strains, and fractures. And not only uh, you perform surgeries, but also you study a lot in technique skills of each sport, for example, tennis and rugby and football and so on. So we not only uh, treat the injuries uh, per se, we also try to talk um, about the prevention of injuries, mechanism of injuries, and what is the best way of treatment to get the person back to game. Yes, because with is sports, not taught, yeah. Which is not taught in orthopedic surgery. Yes. Okay. So it's, it's more um, getting them back out there yes. on a quicker pace. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Now, is that something that's practiced widely, or is it very, very specialized? I mean, if you talk about both come together, orthopedic surgery and sports medicine, I don't think it's that popular, but people are now realizing that if you're an orthopedic surgeon, you better know something about sports medicine. Mm -hmm. Now, we see, on the other hand, quite a lot of orthopedic surgeons in each country and quite a lot of physicians in sports medicine. But we rarely see orthopedic surgeons and sports medicine clubbing together in okay. their academics, in their practice and skills. Okay. So that's what the difference is, yeah. Okay. And that's one of the things that you want to bring to the Philippines. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about what you envision happening? I mean, see, I am... Uh, uh, like anybody, my dream is to promote sports, my dream is to uh, understand sports and to give chances for uh, normal population to get into sports and to understand better about the sports aspects in life. Now, my vision would be to start sports medicine centers. Uh, we already started in uh, three countries which belong to three continents. So now in Philippines, I see quite a lot of demand for that. Mm -hmm. And I believe there is a um, potential uh, candidates here in Philippines who plays uh, football um, and soccer, uh, soccer <laughs> slightly <laughs> different, but football mainly. And uh, we are talking about basketball. And mm -hmm. uh, I see, I treated the uh, rugby sevens, the uh, Philippines rugby team. So mm -hmm. I, I believe there's a potential for rugby too in this part of the world, and I see that there's a lot of demand for the sports medicine um, centers in the Philippines, which I'm looking for. Great. Yeah. And do you have any experience in golf as well? Because I know that the Philippines has a lot Other of really nice Tiger golf courses. Woods, uh, oh, you did? I, yes, oh, I did. Great. In uh, 2009 in Desert Club in um, golfing in uh, Dubai, he had a kind of an ankle injury and we took care of that. And, and as you know that he had a knee surgery done, but Right now, he's getting back to the game, I would say. So people are looking up to him that in a few months or years' time, he'll be, I would say, he'll be top number one again. Great. Yep. Wow. 
I didn't know that, too. Okay, <laughs> there you go. He's number five now, now moved to number three now, so hopefully he's going to reach that. And one thing I know about with Tiger is when he was, uh, he started golf at a very young age, and that's one thing that you were saying that you would like to do with the Philippines is find young talent and help them become big talent. Absolutely. For, for, ex for instance, one of my tennis coaches here, who was uh, Destin, he was telling me the other day, he found a uh, boy of six years old who was playing tennis in a very high professional level. So he's saying, you know, there are a lot of, of their kids um, uh, having the skills but not getting exposed to the national or international level. So I think we need to look into that, saying that kids has to be trained right from the beginning, um, each kind of sports, whatever they love to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And one thing uh, we were talking about earlier was sports typing. So yes. What it what, tell us a little bit about that. I mean, see, this is uh, like any other industry you talk about, you know. Uh, I believe that there should be a, a channel where we can pick up kids right in the beginning and we say, well, what is a performance level, what is the endurance and, you know, conditioning level for each kids so that they can, um, we can prevent injuries, uh, we can treat them uh, in the right way uh, and also to get them back to the game as soon as possible. So there's a bit of um, uh, coding or typing we can do it so to pick up these kids. Uh, for example, uh, m sometimes we say this kid is good for 100 meters sprinting because he's got uh, most of the type 2 fibers in his body. Um, but when you go for ultra cell-to-cell -cell study and um, trainings and conditioning, we found that there's maybe a lot of endurance muscle fibers in this person and this candidate would be good enough to do a marathon instead of a sp mm -hmm. sprinting. So these kind of things can be picked up through this sports center. That's, that's, that's what we're great. looking for. Yes. Okay. Uh, stay tuned. This is Expat Insights. I'm your guest host, Debbie Clemens, and we're just going to take a short break. Welcome back to Expat Insights. To recap, we're talking with Dr. George John about sports medicine. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what they were seeing during the break, the clips? Um, it was, you know, looking back, it was a bit unfortunate for me to start my tennis career when I was younger. And then um, the life is uh, get me so long that I could meet the world number one, Roger Federer, as my patient and to start my career in tennis with him. So what do you see now, the clips here, is um, the, the players uh, in the tennis women and men session are treated over the years, like for the last six to seven years. Um, the clips here is, um, she's um, uh, number one in, from India. She's, um, and as you see here, Roger Federer is uh, world number two now. And uh, you can see Novak world number one now. So uh, I'm very passionate and uh, fortunate, I would say, to, to not only take tennis as my sport, uh, but to treat these guys out there and to get them better. Yeah? So this is some of the clips you're seeing now. Um, do you play tennis? No, no. sorry. <laughs> no, my, my sports were like water polo, swimming, and t-ball. Okay, not bad. Not, yeah. So, the clip is um, again showing, other than the sportsmen, I do a bit of activities on uh, film industries because I was a doctor for the Mission Impossible 4 uh, with Tom Cruise. I spent about um, six to eight weeks. Um, this is uh, Serena Williams and uh, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, all these guys. And this is Ben Gollings, is the captain of England rugby team. Um, so I was fortunate to uh, meet them, to treat them, and to know, study a lot of things happening in the sports industry, sports world, because they are the top guys in each field. And this is my team in uh, Iran football team. He's the vice captain of the Iran team, whom I did a surgery for him, and he is back to game in about three months after the surgery. Ooh. This is a kind of a uh, Ooh, what are you I doing there? So this is a, is a kneecap dislocation. The, you know, we do a new techniques to fix the torn ligament in the knee joint. 
uh, that's kind of a new techniques we use, do in uh, sports medicine. Hmm. And the results were amazing because, as you know, everybody's scared of surgeries. End of the day, <laughs> especially when you talk uh, surgery to a well-known player, mm -hmm. uh, celebrity. But here we see that um, the surgeries are no f very friendly now, that they can get it done and get back to the game with the proper rehab. Yes. Now, I have a question. You, you've focused a lot on tennis. Was that an interest you had? Was that your sport, or how did you get involved in tennis? I mean, first? tennis. Um, see, because my dad was a basketball player back home, and my uncle was a volleyball player. I always wanted to play some racket games. So, unfortunately, instead of the tennis racket, came the badminton racket because it's not I couldn't. The same. <laughs> it's not the same. I couldn't get uh, to the tennis because I have to travel 100 kilometers to the club to get my tennis training, which is uh, those days which was unfortunate. I couldn't get it. So, but later on I realized, I mean, I started my tennis in three years ago and I started realizing that I'm not a bad player. That means I could have taken this much longer. Um, but end of the day, I'm enjoying my tennis and that's my sport now, yes. Okay. That's good. Now, you've also done stuff with rugby. Are the injuries in tennis very different than the injuries you see in rugby? I mean, in uh, tennis, you tend to get... Uh, repetitive overuse injuries mm -hmm. that means you have a small sprain and uh, over the same site again the pressure is coming and over the time it builds up as tendinitis you, you talk about tennis elbow things like that happens and rugby is a hardcore injuries you get fractures you get dislocations you get muscle broken tears, bones broken bones and all that it's a mm -hmm. more complex because uh, you know the velocity of the game is so much that you tend to get all those multi-complex injuries in sports, in, in rugby especially. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and how does that differ from, say, basketball, which is very common here? I mean, basketball uh, is mainly uh, work with your axial loading, we call it. That means the, the platform or the ground force come to your ankle, to the knee, to the hip, and to the spine. So you generally tend to get ankle and knee injuries more than anything else. Of course, with the contacts, some uh, bullying kind of contacts, you get some shoulder injury, but rarely you see that. But most of them have a knee and an ankle injury in basketball. Because every time you land on the knee and ankle, mm -hmm. and you jump, you pivot, you twist, everything happening around the hip and lower limbs, I would say. Yeah. So that's very common to see in basketball. And you don't even have to be a real athlete. My husband was playing basketball with his nephew, and just went for a roundup and boom. Right. This is sprained true, his it's ankle. True. Yeah. I mean, it's very if easy if to you, do. If you if you take up the statistics of sports injuries, most of the injuries happens during training, or it's kind of a casual game, not in the real game. Sometimes you're surprised with that. Really? Yes. Oh. Because in a, in a, I think it basically uh, comes to the fact that in a, in a big scenario of good game, you tend to concentrate more on your movements and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But you know, like you said. Um, at home with the family, you don't tend to concentrate much or uh, be careful much to not to get injured. You go with the flow, and suddenly you see yourself on the floor. Yeah. Yes. That's what happens. Yeah. So how do you prevent injuries? Do you have any tips that you can share I with mean us? It's basically start with um, what kind of a training you have, what kind of uh, uh, coach you have. You know, just if the coach is interested in warming up and stuff like that, cooling down. Most of the time, this should take care of your injuries. Like if your body is not warmed up, and you go and play some games, which is a high velocity game, especially, you tend to tear the ligaments or muscles or get injured. So my way of looking at it is that you should be conditioned. You should be performing high power exercises to build mm -hmm. up your muscles and the joint flexibility. Um, if you continue and take it as a part of your life before sporting, and that should prevent much injuries. But do you, do you believe that you should um, stretch before the warm-up or stretch after the warm-up? Both. Both. Okay, because I've heard absolutely. both sides. I've heard I mean, once I, you've got to keep your muscles absolutely. warm and warmed. then stretch. Yes, absolutely. It's warmed and, and ready to go. The flexibility is there. Then once you uh, you're done the sporting event and you need to give time for the body to cool down, and in the cooling down phase, all your muscles are tense and spasm and you need to release that by doing some stretching exercise. So cooling is very important, and if you, if you talk about any national scenarios, 
um, the councils, sports councils always mention about the cooling down, um, more equal important like the warming up. Okay, so stretching yeah. is very important. Very important. Okay. Now, what happens if you do have an injury? How do you recommend people just start to heal? I mean, that's kind of a uh, difficult scenario here because it depends on what kind of injury you have. It's like a type 1 is a simple sprain, type 2 and type 3. Yeah, 3 being very grievous injuries, like you okay. tear the muscle or break the bone. So if it's a type 1, type 2 can be treated most likely with the rice regime, as you know is the eyes and rest, rest and stuff and like that. Then you do the rehab exercise and physiotherapy and you get along with that and you get better. But severe injuries obviously needs to be taken. Some of them need surgery, then you have to do it immediately, the surgery part of it, and then comes your post rehab. Can you just go over again the rice formula? Um, for what happens when you have an I'm injury, I'm just, sure so you're, you're just so they know. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> just now, so that the audience uh, yeah. can then I mean, rice is take that to you her. Know, is, uh, is, uh, your rest is, mm -hmm. is, a, is a thing which you need. Any part of your body getting injured, no matter what kind of an injury, is rest is the number one thing. Yeah? Okay. And ice, of course, you have inflammation in your part of the body, so you need to have some icing to cool it down. To, to reduce the inflammation. Therefore, the pain also can, and swelling can come down. Okay. Um, then, um, C? C is a compression. You give, you know, because the swelling is there, you need to do some compression part of it to make sure that it is done. Like wrapping with a bandage? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And uh, that that's, that's brings down the swelling again. And okay. any, anything which is immobilized, yeah, and you see the pain and swelling coming down in that part of the joint. Okay. And then E? is elevation yeah. because elevation is nothing but um, for the swelling to come down to get into the circulation of your body flow and that will bring down the swelling and inflammation so therefore the pain can come down. So this is normally the uh, you know tips of uh, doing a basic treatment rice regime everybody follows that and it is a universal uh, you cannot pass this one straight away by any other method so this has to be followed then you do your triaging, mm. find out what is the injuries, and then investigation, then take it to the co correct kind of treatment. So for people that are weekend warriors that participate in a marathon yep. or, or, uh, I, I think they or my carry husband a with the, the basketball, Absolutely. game of pickup basketball. They should carry a first aid kit. They should carry a first aid Absolutely. kit, yes. And they should have mm. some bandage and eyes and, you know, uh, packs and uh, stuff like that, in case if anything happens. Okay. If you may not know, yeah. And has it changed? Because I remember when I was little, it used to be warm. I used to put a, a hot water bottle on I mean, there's on a lot injuries. of controversial thing whether to use the ice or uh, the hot thing. Ice is meant to be acute injuries. Acute injuries, we are talking about anything. One to three weeks, we can put the ice. That like is a sprained ankle would Absolutely. fall under acute. That's an inflammatory okay. period, yeah. Okay. Don't use hot in inflammation because inflammation is, is like, put it this way, inflammation is something like heat generating process. So just imagine you add some heat to that. Mm -hmm. You land up in a, in a instead of a yeah. melon swelling and a football swelling, you land up. So don't do that. You just do the cooling part of it. Then after three weeks, once you've crossed this inflammatory phase, and then you can start using like tendinitis, mm -hmm. if you ask me. You but if, if it's more muscular based, say you you went to the gym and you worked a little too hard or you've taken a long break and then you go to the gym and, and you're your legs are really sore, then you would use... I mean, uh, it, again, it de depends on if not an injury, it's an ongoing, repetitive, some kind of inflammation, then probably you may have to use the heat. Heat, yeah. okay. That's okay. All right. Good. Okay, so now let's talk more about your plans for the Philippines. Right. Uh, plans for the... F I love this place. I don't know um, what... I'm from India. And I'm, I'm trained in England and I live in Dubai. So it's like a three continents. Mix. Yes, mix. Then I landed in uh, Dubai. Uh, I thought this is the place. And uh, there's very friendly people around. So we started our sports center there. Um, we could see the need of uh, the people for this kind of a facility. Then when I came to Philippines, of course, I treated, I t as I mentioned before, I treated your rugby team here. Mm -hmm. um, then I knew some of the, 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 the key players in basketball and uh, what kind of a soccer football they play. And I see that there's a need for this kind of center. 
I mean, this center is not only uh, just to provide some services, it's a learning center too. For me, it's a learning because if you, if you look into the global scenario, you don't see much of sports centers coming in mm -hmm. with all the facility inside, yeah? Um, so when you talk about a sports center, we're talking about clinics, we're talking about surgery unit, we're talking about uh, high performance training, swimming pool, gym, and you have a research lab going on. Mm -hmm. So for example, we do VO2 max, uh, I know VO2 max is something like the, the when you run, oh, the oxygen, the oxygen yeah, yeah. carbon dioxide, you, you know, taking in and mm -hmm. going out, this kind of things we can calculate and we do some blood lactic acid and say your muscle fatigue ability, what's going to happen with your muscle fatigue. Are you prone to fatigue? Are you you have a delayed fatigue in your well, body? Let's say if you're just feeling lazy. It's a feeling lazy, <laughs> very difficult to find out. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm saying this all integrated part of sports medicine coming into the center. Mm -hmm. So anybody can walk in. As I said before, it's not only really like international players walking into the center, no. Anybody, like you mentioned about the weekend warrior, so they can walk into this clinic, into the center. You can do a normal your body assessment, yeah? And you can do a basic treadmill and say a VO2 max and, you know, just to know more about you, your, your body. You can do that. And they can guide you to what kind of uh, dieting, what kind of uh, exercise, what kind of a game you have to follow to make you fit and make, to love the sport what you do. doesn't matter what sport you do. You can enjoy more by learning more about your way of dealing with those kind of sports. Yeah? So That's it's like a sports sport. prescription. Absolutely. Absolutely, it's kind of that. But on the other scenario, you have a ligament torn, like an ACL ligament in the knee is torn, or you don't know how to go about it. And of course, that will lead to surgery, and that can be done in the same center too. So when you do the surgery, you have the rehab, right? And they have the high performance training, and you get you back to the game. The, if you ask any of the orthopedic surgeons in the world, the, one, of the, one of the difficult situation scenario we are facing is that after we do, because for me, like I've done maybe more than 5,000 arthroscopic surgeries myself. Wow. And then the question is when I do a surgery after one month I see the patient, after two months I see the patient, and I don't know how he's going to run in the ground because I'm not going there. You understand? Um, this kind of sports center, after the rehab, we have a high performance training center. It's like a big ground where we can watch the gait analysis, we call it. We can r make sure that they run, they run or tackle properly to train them. Because that training is different from your normal scenario, right? This is after your surgery you're talking mm -hmm. about. So that should be different. So those oh, really? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh. Yeah. Because you lost your ligament, we put a new ligament for you, and, is, and you are going to rehab that ligament. And one point comes, you don't know how to really use them because you're a bit of scared here. Yeah. Can the ligament come out again? You know, a lot of questions and fear in you, that can be removed in getting into this rehab centers. So you do have to make adjustments after a surgery just Absolutely. until you can get your feet wet again Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and do that. Now and how, sorry, uh, get I was just going to say, how long is the recovery after a, a I major mean for surgery? For knee ligament reconstructions, we generally say six to nine months you can get back to the game. But oh. you can run in two months. Good news. You can do swimming in one week. Uh -huh. yeah. But that, that's good for the weekend warriors, but for professional athletes, I'm sure you must have had a lot of, I mean, a lot of pushback on that. Yes, we, we are put to a stage where we are, we are uh, first of all, forced to take a decision saying to the, the client or the sports person that you need a surgery. And uh, acceptance comes from the player or from the manager, from the club or from the team. Um, it won't be coming straight away because they need to discuss all the sponsorship and stuff like that. And once the candidate decides for the surgery, um, then we have to inform him. The truth is, it's only after six months you play again. Mm -hmm. Or nine months. It depends on how many ligaments we reconstruct, how many meniscus we repair, stuff like that. So, or once they're prepared, then we do the things. So of course, like you said, it's a long waiting for them. They might lose money, they might frustrate it. So if you ask me, sports medicine also involves the psychology part of it. Yes. yes. <laughs> you need a yeah. strong mind to go for a surgery first of all, or uh, to believe that you can get back to the game. Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of um, psychological aspects in sports medicine. That also is an integrated part of the sports medicine center. And you need to have a strong doctor who's willing to stand up <coughs> and say, no, I'm sorry, you're not, 
I mean, yeah, see, I've been, been there for, I mean, seven, eight years. I mean, getting involved in day, various international World Cup tournaments. I did the 2009 World Cup rugby. I was a tournament doctor for the whole thing. I had 135 medical staff with me. And we had about 300, 400 injuries. So you imagine in wow. three days, you get a, get a high volume of injuries. And the decision making has to be very fast. Mm -hmm. Because either say yes or no. And if it is no, the reason why no. And if it's yes, is there any anticipation for another injury happening in the next one day, two days? Mm -hmm. So you'll be under stress. But eventually, um, this has uh, been going on for years. And we learn the psychology. We learn the attitude of the players and the teams overall. And you have to have their trust. Absolutely. I mean, see, what they look into that, if they see the familiar faces around as a medical professional, we, they come to us. We don't have to, uh, don't have to worry. Because um, one of the surprising things for me last year in uh, 2011 uh, London uh, mm -hmm. Satellite Tournament, one of the last tournaments of the TPWTA, when Roger got injured, and I was watching the game and he, Roger fell on his wrist. And I was telling my colleagues, oh, maybe he got some injuries, mm -hmm. ligaments and stuff like that. In two days he was in Dubai seeing mm -hmm. me. So I was surprised how he get it to us. Because once they know that you're there, you know what you're doing is correct, they trust you. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of the night you might get a call from one of the top players asking your advice or when you can meet. Is it something serious? Should I stop playing for the time being? So. This is over the time you gain this one because you're not there for one year. You're there for six, seven years and they're seeing you two, three times in a year. Mm -hmm. And more than the players and the, the doctor-patient relationship, they become part of it, like a friend, you know, mm -hmm. like um, they go out, we have dinner together, we go to clubs and, uh, you know, all these kind of things can happen in the, in, in the scenario. So, they, like you said, there should be a trust mm -hmm. with these people, yes. And it seems to be more of a, of a, a doctor-patient um, relationship than say you would have with with an obstetrician or I mean see once you have an injury uh, once or once I do a surgery I know you need more than anybody in the world so you know so for me it's easy to explain to you yeah. or e easy to take your trust in me or build up the relationship from there onwards you understand so mm -hmm. we ultimately come to a stage where we have a, a very strong relationship and they will, you know, sometimes I get patients from France landing up in clinic in Dubai and I ask them, why are you here? They say, referred by Roger Federer. He <laughs> told me to come and see you. I'm say, my goodness. You understand? So yeah. there's a lot of trust and um, uh, they support you. Eventually they support you, the players, and to recognize you as a sports surgeon. So I'm enjoying the end of the day. Good. Yeah. Good. And just quickly before we go to break, would you recommend orthopedics and sports medicine to most people, or do you need to have a specific qualification or interest in the I field? I mean, it depends on my, my, see, some of the orthopedic surgeons, they don't want to be associated with sports. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh. Some of the surgeons, um, they, they tend to believe that, okay, sports medicine is different. Hmm. Yeah? Uh, okay, look at the other scenario. If you ask a sports medicine guy, I said, sports medicine alone, cannot be surgeons, okay? Mm -hmm. You have to have a master's and fellowship in sports medicine and they are recognized as a physician. You're not a surgeon. So they say, okay, my part is this much. I don't want to be a surgeon. Yeah. I don't want to take headaches. I'm happy with all what I'm doing. That's different, you know. Mm -hmm. But for me, if you want to be really, really good and if you want to really be uh, providing the best of your service, I think you should know both. Okay. Great. Sure. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll be right back. Stay watching, and we'll be back with Dr. George Shaw. And we're back. Uh, we've got uh, 10 more minutes, so let's focus on what you'd like to share about bone health, uh, specifically for the Philippines. Absolutely. One um, of the uh, put it this way, I went to Cape Town. You know, have you been to Cape Town? No, sorry. It's one of the beautiful places. I've heard. And uh, it's, it's a place where the desert ocean and uh, your landscape is excellent there. It's merging all these three together. The sky, the everything together. It's an open area. So when I visited there about six years ago, 
I was associated with the rugby, as you know, International Rugby Board. I was one of the doctor for them. Then I went there to have a look at the place around. And we had one tournament, so I finished my tournament and my colleague said, do you mind visiting our sports center? It's one of the world-renowned sports center in Cape Town. Okay. So I went there. The first thing I saw is a, is a, is a uh, you know, treadmill, standalone treadmill. And you look at the other side, there are thousands of treadmill in that particular sports center. So I was just asking them, why this particular one? You know, maybe the president of South Africa is running on this one. Mm -hmm. Something, you know, what is the difference? And they said, no, there's a, just watch after five minutes who's running there. And Debbie, you won't believe a 82-year-old lady running on that treadmill. Wow. So then it's striking me saying that at the age of 82, you still can run, number one. Number two, you still have a life. Yeah, most <laughs> of us feel that, you know, after, yeah. uh, for example, especially with the ladies after postmenopausal, you tend to lose your bone quite a lot. And they, they supplement with some hormones, sometimes... Um, Calcium, uh, calcium the one of the medications. But the question down here is that when the doctors are telling me in Cape Town that this lady's bone strength is still pretty good in spite of taking any of the supplements. So it brings back to the basic concept of having, if you have a regular exercises, like axial loading, you, you stimulate your bone to produce more of osteoblast, we call it, the small cells, which is a good cells of your uh, bones. Okay. If you stimulate that, uh, on the run, you see that you don't need anything much. You, you still have a good sufficiency of calcium and vitamin D, everything in your bone. Now, and uh, this is something which we need to really look into. How healthy our population is? Are they doing exercise? Are they preventing uh, the osteoporosis or what we call as a weak bones? Uh, if not, uh, what, is, what is that we can do for them? Mm -hmm. So. I might call this as a retirement sports center where people over the age of 50, 60, 70 can walk into the sports center. Do not like us maybe exercises, but a moderate exercises either to build up your bone strength or, or you can say um, to, to maintain your bone strength over the time. So this is very important because as you see the Dreadly um, figures of US and UK that uh, after the age of 60 they have most likely the fractures. You know, if you have a slight mm -hmm. trivial fall, you fracture your hip or Oh, yeah, or if something. you fracture your hip, yes, it's absolutely. downhill. It's very well yeah. known and you're stuck in your life mm -hmm. because you cannot move whether you perform a surgery and the results of the surgery on an osteoporotic bone. It's not that promising compared to what you have in a mm -hmm. young, normal, healthy person. Well, the so Philippines would be great for that because we, d we do attract a lot of retirees with the warm weather. I um, understand. I'd I like to retire here. There's no snow. <laughs> uh, absolutely. I mean, it's a potential place because I would call uh, Philippines, if I have to make a center for Asia, and I'm very proud to say that should be in Philippines. The mm -hmm. center of my sports center should be in Philippines. Of course, I can start in India. I can start it in Thailand. I can start it in anywhere. But I want to make this as uh, the center of the Asian community, the sports center. So anybody can fly in, anybody can come in to do, stay with us and get the training or whatever at different ages. Now we are talking about elderly people. We will concentrate on them, have a specific kind of training and exercises which they can enjoy their life, you know, end of the day. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, a life without pain is the best thing you yeah. can have it. And I strongly believe in that. And uh, we should not neglect our elderly, you know, population in Philippines. We should give them a chance to get into this exercise regimes and uh, make their life more fruitful. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm looking at. Because we're living longer, so it's Absolutely. better to actually Absolutely. be to active longer active and, and, and have uh, more. Not sick and uh, bedridden and not in the hospital, but rather they should be on the street enjoying like anybody else. Mm -hmm. And that's another way to also keep some of the, the talent here. Absolutely. Instead of the brain drain, people leaving the Philippines for other countries, it's to keep the talent here. Here, especially. Which and they should, be a, they should be a role model for many of the youngsters saying that, yes, at the age of this elderly, they still can be fit and uh, healthy. And that's what, you know, whatever you have, money, property, everything, if you don't have a good health, you may not be able to enjoy those things. So we should give a 
fair chance for elderly people mm -hmm. to get a good lifestyle. Good. Now, who would you say is your favorite athlete to work with? Favorite. Your favorite athlete. Athlete. Has to be Roger Federer. Yes. Because um, he's uh, more than a uh, patient, he's a friend to me, and um, when, he, when he travels, like in Asia, he always mentions my name, I don't know why, he went to <laughs> India recently and he said, I have a good friend from India, he's Dr. John. I mean, he's kind of an ambassador of things, and I love sports, and uh, if you look at my first sports center, it's my own branding, mm -hmm. and that branding came from Roger. We were sitting in a coffee and he mentioned, Look, you start your own brand. Oh. Yeah. And I started my own brand and it's doing very well in Dubai. This is the same brand is going to come to Dubai, I mean to the Philippines or Kenya or Europe, wherever I start. Oh, yeah. that's great. So he's a, he's, a, uh, he's a very ambassador of sports, I would call it. You know, he's a, in celebrity-wise, in, in, um, in sports industry, I would say, Roger Federer, I mean, uh, Tiger Woods was number one in all of the ambassador and uh, branding. But I think now everyone claimed that which is Roger. Okay. He's number one. And he's, uh, he's a great guy. And um, he's a great ambassador for tennis. And in, in any other sports, he's a good guy. And he's a good father of twins uh, recently. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's very funny also. And I said, how do you do exercise? And he said, I take my twins in my hands and do the dumbbell. Eh? So it's very <laughs> funny. And I've done that. You've <laughs> done that. But the, most of the time he lives in Dubai, so, you know, it's great to have him there. So he's one of my favorites all time. Great. And do you have some five tips you can give to our audience about sports and how to get active? Um, uh, tips for sports, I would say, play smart. Okay. Very important. And um, learn your body. You should learn your body if you want to be successful in your career. Um, then I would say, very important thing I would always say is uh, make sure that you are well hydrated. It's very, very important rather than anything else. Uh, then, uh, goal saying prevention is better than anything else. So you try to prevent you getting injured. And uh, the last, it's not a tip, I'm encouraging everybody to join our sports center in Philippines. <laughs> that you'll get more tips. Oh, okay. <laughs> there you go. For more tips. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, end of the day, this is what the message is that sports is a industry where nothing can affect sports. Even the economy of the nation can go down, politicians or whatever you say, sports, i never seen them going down. Sports is great, it can build up your relationship, we can build up your uh, good feeling of, about yourself, your personality, and uh, away from disease. Mm -hmm. So sports is the answer to most of the problems in life. Sports is good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you Dr. John for being on Expat Insights. Um, next week, uh, Raju will be having someone from the garment trade industry. And I hope you enjoyed the show. Thank you for watching. Good day and Mabuhai. Thank you.